Good afternoon and welcome to the Poison Pen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a terrific discussion on baseball. We're gonna be talking baseball spring training with two people who've written books about it and very knowledgeable about it. And um, uh, spring training here in Scottsdale and um, both authors are very familiar with it. So we're gonna get right into it. But before we talk about the books, uh, we have Emily Niemans who wrote a book called Cactus League, and that is the fictional account of spring training. And we have, uh, she's also, by the way, an accomplished artist, right? And a illustrator, a jazz musician, an editor, and a first time novelist. This is her first book, which she, and she chose baseball. And for the rest of us slackers who don't have that kind of accomplishment, um, um, we have uh, John Shea, who is a longtime award-winning baseball writer, who has uh, been covering spring training since the Black Sox scandal. Is that true? A little before that, when Ty Cobb played out here. <laughs> That's what the rumor was. And he's written a wonderful book about the great Willie Mays, who, if he isn't the best baseball player that ever walked the baseball field, he's in the top three. Um, and it's titled 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid. Uh, and we were fortunate to have uh, John with us last year when the book first came out. Uh, but before we discuss the books, I think we should get to know you a little bit and how you got into baseball um, and, and in general, where did, it, where did it come from? Emily? Sure. I grew up in Seattle uh, watching the Mariners in, in the late 80s and early 90s. And my dad was a Yankees fan. He's from the Bronx and, and grew up Ooh. walking distance from Yankee Stadium. And he arrived in Ooh. Seattle around when the Mariners did. And um, my mother and my sister had no interest in going to the kingdom. So it was me, my dad, and Ken Griffey Jr. And, you know, I was six years old, his his rookie season, and I just fell for baseball. I fell for the Mariners. I did not fall for the kingdom. Uh, it was not a great place to watch base. I mean, it was great fun as a, a kid, but um, coming to Arizona, which we started doing, I guess in the earlier mid nineties and, and seeing a weekend of spring training, you know, figuring out how to see four games in five days or including travel and, um, watching baseball outside, watching baseball in these small, intimate, friendly stadiums. Right. Uh, I just fell in love. So I've been a baseball fan my whole life and, and have been an Arizona fan for, for nearly as long. And I see you, you also started this project when you were going for your master's degree. Yeah, yeah. I lived um, on the East Coast for a while and I was you know, sort of doing the New York rat race thing Loved it, but I wasn't reading enough or writing enough, enough. So at the end of my 20s, I decided to go back to grad school and I, I got an MFA at Louisiana State University. And, you know, the sports culture there also definitely fed into the Cactus League in sort of indirect ways. Watching um, just SEC football was an amazing experience. And um, I got to know the, the baseball team there pretty well and um, some, some alum and just so, watched a lot of really great collegiate baseball. So those two experiences and learning how to write um, my first novel all sort of converged in South Louisiana. Very good. And John, how did you get into? Well, Emily followed a guy who wore 24 in a lousy stadium. And I guess I could say the same thing. Mays played at Candlestick Park. So I was around for the tail end of his career and late 60s, early 70s. So that's what I recall. Maybe he was on the final leg, but in 1970, he was a heck of a ball player. He still led the league in on-base percentage and most walks and stole 23 bases and 26 attempts. A man who's 40, you know, nowadays those guys don't play, but that was Willie Mays. He had a lot of really good years, but so that was an influence going out there. I mean, like the kingdom, for Emily, Candlestick Park, you know, we didn't know any better. That was, that was the place. That was the place to go. And Did you and, know to bring your coat, at least? Well, oh, yeah, because you knew, you knew that at your house at 
you know, two o'clock, it's 90 degrees and people are saying, why are you bringing the parka? Because I'm going to Candlestick Park. And they say, oh, okay, because it's now 45 or 50. <laughs> it's just you cross the bridge and it's all over. But yeah, I mean, it just it, one thing led to another. And, uh, you know, the Giants and the A's, the Giants came first to, to the Bay Area and the A's won all the time in the 70s. But, uh, you know, following the Giants in those years and going to San Diego for college, uh, you know, got out and worked at some smaller papers covering the Padres. So I covered Tony Gwynn in the 1984 Padres, who lost to Detroit in five games. And then in 1988, I returned to the Bay Area and worked on a number of papers. And and then that's, you know, I came back in 88 and you're talking to, you know, Willie Mays who was suspended for no particular reason other than working at a casino and signing autographs and playing golf with clients was out of the game until Peter Uberoff came around in late 84, early 85. So Mays was back in the game in 86. He rejoined the giants in the front office and I showed up in 88 and I listened to his every word. And from there, I, there a relationship was born fortunately and you know, I asked him about a book quite a while ago, and he agreed, saying he'd like to put it in in uh, schools. So we kind of went from there. Okay. Well, Emily, like your father, I grew up in the Bronx also, but uh, I was a Giant fan because of Willie Mays. Twenty years before he became John, became knew him in uh, in San Francisco, and. Um, I was six, seven years old, and, and he, he hit the major leagues, and that was it for me. Of course, when they left for San Francisco, it broke my heart and all of that. But anyway, um, and talking about, I just want to show both books before we can. This is uh, 24 with Willie Mays by John. And you showed Emily's before, I think. This is upside down. <laughs> No, that was right. Okay, Cactus League. It's backwards on the screen. <laughs> Very confusing. Anyway. Um, so, Emily, you're a big baseball fan. And where did you start to research? The characters in the book are, there, I, I believe, nine or ten different characters and or situations. Uh, and where did you research um, to put them in, in this context of spring training? Yeah, I really wanted to write about about characters, about people and lived experiences and not just there is, you know, an all star player, a star outfielder in the middle of the Cactus League, but I wanted to sort of build concentric circles around that star athlete, Jason Goodyear, and think about other experiences of spring training. So, you know, I really love Elizabeth Strout and Olive Kittredge and and thinking about these sort of long and complicated um, but individual stories and how they can all fit together into one narrative was was something that I I think I started with that. So, you know, I started thinking about Tammy, the divorcee who moves to Arizona to sort of start over and is hoping to have a good spring by by meeting someone meaningful to her. Um, I thought about Greg Carver, the the pitcher who never quite his career never quite lifted off before he had Tommy John. And so I, I had this set of characters that I knew I wanted to write about and I sort of got their stories, um, the emotional story down first. <laughs> and then in revision, I'd say like every three paragraphs, I was like, oh, I need to research that. So, you know, I had a vague sense of Tommy John, but then I ended up just doing like a real deep dive into um, efficacy and, and the process for that surgery. The same with, um, you know, Tammy is dating a property developer in Scottsdale. And so I had to go do a lot of research sort of about uh, the last 15 or 20 years of development in Scottsdale and, and the building of, um, of the stadium. And so I feel like every page or two, there would just be a diversion to go do that research. And some of it was on the ground in Scottsdale for sure, but a lot of it was online. A lot of it was, um, you know, reading journalism about what was going on in Arizona over the last 30 years. In, in John's book, one of the paragraphs Willie has is titled, Life in Baseball Isn't, Aren't Fair. 
and I think a lot of those characters in the book have have that experience that life isn't fair. Their you know, spring training is um, it's not a it's almost a, a ritual where, where um, there's expectation, there's hope, there's um, hype, all kinds of things for people, you know, both for the players and for the fans and all of the pe people surrounding the game. Um, but life isn't fair. It's, it's a really meritocracy. I mean, you, you can do it or you can't. And the level that they're at is obviously very high, but it, it but it, it isn't fair. And they, I mean, they always strive to be as good as they could be, but there's always somebody better. Yeah. Um, and they're just <laughs> one play and one game away from what happened to uh, Carver in your, in your book. Right. And, you know, most baseball fiction is about, um, you know, the shot heard around the world or some other world series or end of season, um, conflict, right? Who's going to win the game? Who's going to win the season? Who's winning the pennant? And in spring, hope springs eternal. Um, everyone has this opportunity opening up before them. But also, you know, every Thursday with cut day is a door closing for someone and um, losing that opportunity to really make their careers um, change their lives. So I was really interested in sort of inverting the triangle of um, of where a conflict is in baseball and, and seeing what would happen if you, I wrote about the spring rather than about October. Okay, John, in, in your years of experience at the ballparks in spring training, uh, how, does, how does those kind of expectations and like she said, every Thursday is cut day. There are a few like Mays and a handful of others don't even worry about those kind of things. Um, but for most of the, I, I think each team brings close to 100 players, or at least they used to in the standard spring training. Um, and obviously some, some people know they're just on the beginning path, but um, your book has a phenom who signs for several million dollars and of course looks around and realizes he doesn't belong there. And, and uh, but how do the day-to-day -day player deal with with that kind of um, pressure, actually, I guess what you'd have to say. Well, they often knew when cut day was because it was usually the day before the meal money goes out. So you don't want to cut a guy on a Thursday when you gave him a full week's worth of meal money on a Tuesday. So to save a few bucks, they always do it, you know, right before the meal money. But you're right. It's you know. For, for a lot of them, they know their destination. They know that they're going to start an A ball or double A or maybe even triple A. Or maybe they're on the fringe and they have an out in their contract saying, hey, if you don't want me, I'm walking to another team or they hope for a trade. But you're right. The Willie Mazes of the world didn't have to worry about that. I remember Willie McCovey, you know, the great teammate and first baseman Hall of Famer himself told me, it was just a darn shame because we'd come in and try to work out. It took forever to get back in shape. And you'd use that time here in spring training for just that. And Willie would show up in mid-season form. And McCovey just said everybody was ticked off about this. It's just not possible. But I asked Willie, I said, well, how did you get into shape? And he looked at me and says, well, I never got out of shape. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's. Some of that is is just genetics. I mean, he was blessed with a with a wonderful body too. Well, hard work. You yes, know, behind the scenes, hard work. I mean, let's not forget that. I mean, he he didn't just become a baseball player. I mean, a whole childhood and and learning the hard way in the Negro leagues, where folks like you know Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle didn't have to suffer, right? right. Um, you know, Mickey uh, Willie had to do a lot more. Imagine. Mays versus Mickey, you know, Mickey drank throughout his whole career. Imagine if Willie did that. I mean, he, he there's certain things, right. you know, an African-American at the time just couldn't get away with. And he lived life, you know, in, in an exemplary fashion. So, so therefore, you know, he always took the right road. And yeah, I mean, you could go down the list, 
of great major league ball players. And who are they? Well, you know, Ted Williams. Uh, yeah, great fighter pilot. You know, wonderful. It, nothing against Ted Williams. But one thing he never did was like tip his cap to the crowd to acknowledge the fans. You know, Ty Cobb with the high spikes and Babe Ruth just regretted not being a manager. Pete Rose, you know, with the gambling issue. Barry Bonds, we know that, those issues. Um, you know, you go on and down mantle with his alcoholism and, 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 and all that. But you look at Mays and say, well, what did he do? That, you know, there's no police blotter and there's, there's nothing he did that really surfaced. You know, you could say, well, he got suspended for gambling and I went over that. What did he do? By today's standards, you know, these guys do everything but wear the casino label on their cap. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's another big difference between 50 years ago, spring training, even here, was segregated. Black players and white players didn't go to the same hotels, didn't go to the same restaurants. And that's a, a big difference. And in your in the book, there's a lot of um, back and forth between players. Um, you, I, when I read it, I sensed a little animosity between players, the rookie with the big big money not performing, not helping the team, um, and that that aspect is, like you said, a lot of them know where they belong or where they're places but they're still trying to make the team get that big uh, check although I don't I think for most of them it's to make the team to begin with to be a major league baseball player um, and in fact in this Sunday's paper here there was a story about an out outfielder who had made the Dodgers a few years ago but injuries for the last couple of years um, decimated his career now he's back and he's 30 year old player trying to hook up with whatever team he can and you, you sense some of that angst even in some of the you know like Craig Carver you know who knows his career is over because of failed Tommy Johnson surgery yeah yeah I mean I I certainly am a hopeful person but I'm also a, a realist and I, I wanted to think about you know how people support one another or struggle through these real challenges of, you know, um, the expectation that you're going to be that, um, uh, that you're going to come back from Tommy John and it doesn't work. Or, um, you know, one of the players that you were referring to is the best, the best baseball player in New Jersey. He's drafted right out of high school and he just face plants when he gets to Arizona. And I think he'll still have a great career, but this is a horrible year for him. And, um, how does he just, you know, recalibrate and, and still, you know, try to be a part of this team, try to make a good first impression when everything, you know, he's just miffing all the time and, and, you know, on the field, but also with his teammates, because, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I was doing research about how many players come and at one point draft, I think I had a hundred players and I was talking to, um, uh, Sandy Alderson was an early reader for me and he said you know that's crazy no one brings 100 players anymore and I was like I know but isn't that exciting that like the, the the clubhouse will be that crowded and and that many people will be buying and so I, I think I left it in the upper 80s but I notched it down a little bit um and so just you know thinking about um yeah all the ways that it can go right but all the things that might go wrong too and and for some guys you know it is just sort of like who has the winter weight and and who needs to you know get their swing back and 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 get their pitch velocity i think that's a really important part of spring training as well and and for fans you know that that first look and exclusive look at those uh players we love and and being able to get closer to them um i wanted to think about that too Apropos of, of John, you have a sports writer in, in this book, mm -hmm. uh, unemployed, but a, a sports writer who goes into depth talking about the geology of Arizona. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did that come up, up apart, uh, be part of this? Um, it came up, you know, I was really interested in, as I said, I was reading a lot, you know, sports literature, 
sports journalism. Um, I was also reading a lot about place and thinking about place as, as uh, a character and um, writers like McPhee, like Mishner, sort of taking that bird's eye view, looking at a place, not just in the present day or in the recent history, but thinking about um, sort of the larger context of even before human interaction and interference on the landscape, what was here. And because, you know, the inciting incident of the book is a new stadium rising from, from uh, an empty plot of land, I really wanted to think about that landscape and, and what was there and how it's changed over, not just, you know, since the advent of the Cactus League, but over the last several uh, epics really. And, and, and just sort of putting, putting the human scale and perspective felt important. Yeah. Those are well-written pieces. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm a little bit scared to be talking to John about imagining a, a sports writer, but uh, it was, it, um, you know, it was a very different voice than the rest of the book. And I, it, at one point it was on, you know, the butcher block and I just couldn't, couldn't let it go. And I, I really wanted to figure out how to, to keep this voice in there. And I realized, you know, he has this sort of omniscient view. He understands what's going on in this universe in a way that no one else does. And who does that in the sports universe? It's the sports writer. They, they understand um, how the world works in a way that fans don't, in a way that players can't necessarily see from their vantage. And, and that sort of clicked together for me and I was able to um, find his voice. Well, John, in that, in that context, as, as a longtime sports writer, there are things you write about, the things you know you don't write about. <laughs> and at it, where is that? The line gets crossed a lot today. And never was that way in the past. I think, like you said, Mickey Mantle drank forever, but sports fans didn't. But today, you know, if one of your characters walked into a casino, it's, you know, his picture would be flashing in every newspaper, magazine, TV show in the world. How do you develop, you know, what what you write about versus what you know and you don't write about? You know, it's all about trust. And and first of all, Emily's talking about the uh, the uh, out of work baseball writer. And, and when I read this so-called out of work baseball writer in every chapter i'm thinking this guy is so good he should be working somewhere or she what but right. uh that's a well-written thing to say what what newspaper would 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 uh put this poor person out of work? i mean it's just uh, amazing stuff um where do you draw the line it's it's trust and now the age of twitter i, I remember breaking in i used to travel with the teams i used to stay at the same hotels. Uh, so yeah, you would see things on the road that, you know, the trust factor, you you just wouldn't write about. But now in this era, you know, it seems people would tweet that. They would uh, post it on Instagram or wherever. And so therefore, I think it was early 90s when they kind of cut the cord on that, which is fine. You know, it's, it's, it's probably better that you don't travel with the team or stay at their hotels. Obviously my company pays for everything, but you don't want any favors. You don't want them to do you any favors because they would imagine that you owe them and you don't want to owe them. You want to make sure you report, um, you know, the truth. And if, you know, their favors are exchanging, then, is it easier to hide the truth? I don't know. But I, I guess you last long enough in this business because of trust. And if a player or manager or general manager or scout or whomever, you know, trusts you, that's really the, it's all about access and availability. And you know, nowadays we don't have that because we're not allowed into the clubhouses or on the field. And baseball is such a game of intimacy and romanticism and and up close storytelling and things you don't maybe see in football or even basketball but baseball traditionally for more than 100 years it was about telling the stories behind the scenes on the scenes whatever it may be about the characters you know emily's talking about all the characters and 
you know, these are real life characters who all have a story to tell. And in the Willie Mays book, 24, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to Emily talk about the characters and I'm thinking, yeah, that, that's wonderful. And, and reading, reading her book and coming down here so, so often, it's like, the, it's like, these are, these are real things that are happening. I said, this is real. This is, this is, uh, this is not fiction, but it's obviously fiction, but you know, and with, with Willie, you know, the characters start with his father, Willie Howard Mays Sr. And, and uh, you know, Piper Davis, his first manager and only manager with the Black Barons in Birmingham. And Monty Irvin, his first uh, roommate with the Giants. Uh, he was 10 years older, but former Negro League legend himself took Willie under his wing. And Leo DeRocher, of course, you know, who somehow those are two complete opposites, a young Willie Mays and an old, well-lived Leo, uh, they were just perfect for each other. And the characters really make this story because you know, spending time with Willie for the book, and I spent more than 100 hours with him, and interviewed more than 200 people for the book. So, so I, I guess my job is just putting it on a tee for Willie and, and letting him show up and you know hit it out of the park and uh, having everybody else from you know presidents to hall of famers to commissioners to managers um supplement his storytelling so it's almost like you, you know we're all three of us sitting at a bar and going through chapter and chapter and then you know every page willie would would uh tell his side of what we're talking about to kind of um you know up the ante on the whole whole thing here and that, that's the beauty of it it's, it's willie's words his genuine willie wrote words that you might not be able to use in a typical autobiography because so many autobiographies you read say oh, man i know that guy didn't see he, he doesn't know that date he doesn't know that time so it was my job to 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 give the date and the time and for willie to give his opinion and i thought he did it pretty well yeah this yeah really I, I loved it. I mean, I just, I think like the radical trust, you were talking about trust between um, the team and, and the players and, and the journalists, but uh, the stories he tells and that you're able to sort of amplify and build the world around um, through research and, and dogged research, I can tell. I didn't realize 200 people though, that's, that's a lot of interviews. Yeah, you, you just mentioned that you, you're not allowed at the clubhouse anymore or on the field. Yeah, so yesterday the Giants played at Scottsdale Stadium. And what did I do? I pretty much go hotel room to press box to hotel room to press box to hotel room. As opposed to last year before baseball shut down, I'm getting there at you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock. I have access to the clubhouse. I can go up to any player, um, hang around at the batting cage, in the dugouts. But now, obviously, you know, it's – different tiers you know the field people might be tier one the general manager the trainer the players the staff and then tier two might be uh you know the the scouts in the in the stands who can't get close to the player but they're there and tier three you know we're up high in the press box uh so you know we you know before this i did interviews with uh you know giants players on zoom and you know I, i've done a's players and pretty much you have access to whomever the team puts on for you, but it's not like normal where you would decide who you speak with and yeah. you would decide which angle. I mean, they're very helpful. The PR staff bends over backwards these days to make it possible to have some kind of normalcy, but it's just not the same. But, um, you know, we do our best. We all have to adjust, right? Since a year ago, the three of us made incredible adjust adjustments and we're gonna have to continue that. So, but that's more related to COVID than formal policy for future oh it's all COVID yeah okay one of but the I I did write a little bit about this in the book is sort of the hype machine around athletes and I mean I think Willie um just really did you know uh fly right you know and 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 had didn't have any skeletons to to unearth necessarily but you know in contemporary baseball, I think there's, you know, a lot of coverage and a lot of protection and a lot of interfaces between athletes. And, um, you know, as Twitter has amped up, so have um, a certain number of protections for athletes. And, and that's definitely um, something I wanted to think about and, and trouble with Jason is, you know, if that wall starts to crack, uh, what happens and 
what happens to him, what happens to the team, what happens to his shoe deal, um, all of that. Yeah. One of the uh, characters or groups of characters in the book, which has an important impact, are the women, the wives, the girlfriends, the hangers on. Um, Uh, you t they come, some of them come to the spring training. It disrupts family life. I mean, they've got kids in school. This is only for six weeks, right in the middle of typically a, of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, they're dealing with high priced players who have their own six weeks of what they have to do, regardless of family. Um, but they're an important part of the story. They're an important mm -hmm. part of the book, but they're a really important part of the story also for for um, uh, for these players and for, for uh, the team to deal with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I wanted to write about women. I wanted to write about sort of how they fit into the ecosystem. You know, I loved A League of Their Own. Um, I liked that sort of improbable baseball show pitch um, that was in a couple of years ago. There's a there's another baseball book that came out last year called The Resistors where this like 15 year old girl has the best arm in America. But I wanted to write about how women exist in the baseball environment um, currently and, and realistically and maybe a bit pessimistically, but um, um, you know, just, just think about those dimensions of how vital they are as support to so many athletes and coaches and, and owners and um, you know I think the Giants are changing that right with with um, their coaching staff but um, just you know giving these women agency and and story and um, you know the capacity to um, shape their own narratives within the baseball season but also being honest where you know it's really still a man's world um, of course on the field but you know that whole families are, are moved around and impacted uh, by the by the roster. And you know, even if you have a great contract and and you know the the challenge is not an economic one, it's still I think really hard to have to uproot your life and move when your husband gets traded or you know not move and not be with your partner for you know seven months of the year, right? Between spring training and the season. And and what does that feel like? And and how how do you build community when when you're so sort of radically displaced? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, a, a part of baseball that doesn't really get spoken of uh, very often, um, and in a lot of cases, it's not economics because of these these guys are. I think what is the average salary, John? Now, four or five hundred thousand minimum. Oh no, the minimum is between five hundred thousand and six hundred thousand. The average salary is more about three million dollars. Yeah, but I meant the minimum. Yeah. Four million. So for a lot of this, it's not really uh, uh, economics, but it is. I mean, one of the things I read in the book, and I don't know if this was something you made up or, or. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> but it was a. Um, what did you call it? I wrote it down. I can, let me see if I can find it. Professional sports match -making. Oh, I made that up. I mean, oh, I think it's probably- I, I'm sorry, thing. I thought that was directed to me, my bad. No, no, no. Um, yeah, just the idea that, you know, sometimes I, I, I kind of imagine for baseball players who want to get into a committed relationship, they're busy guys, you know, uh, having, a, having a, um, a dating service would probably be helpful. Um, but I made that one up, Larry. Okay. Uh, I, I, it could be true, you know. It could be either. true. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, you you obviously travel as much as the players do during the season. Um, what what is how does that impact you in your in your general life? Well, uh, I uh, I was here a year ago, and if I flew home uh, after baseball shut down, I would have uh, reached one million miles on United. Wow. And I'm still one flight away from one million miles on United. So in other words, I, I, I drove here. I haven't been on a plane uh, since. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or, or a bad thing, Larry. 
that's a whole lot of time uh, not at home with my family, but right. I've been have the opportunities I've had to, you know, cover baseball. Shoot, I, I have no complaints. Um, and to, to, you know, this is a project of a lifetime that I just did with Willie Mays. I, I earlier wrote uh, Ricky Henderson's autobiography. So I, I thought about this after the book came out with Willie and I said, shoot, I, I wrote, I, I was a bi biographer for, for Ricky Henderson, the greatest Oakland A ever, and Willie Mays, the greatest giant ever. I said, who am I? You know, why, why am I here? Why, why, why am I so fortunate and lucky? And um, things just uh, rolled my way and I, you know, haven't stopped pinching myself, really. Well, I think uh, talent always rises, John. <laughs> People know where the, where the good ones are. So. Yeah, it's, it's good to get breaks. Um, by the way, you mentioned the history of, of the Cactus League and also uh, African-Americans and, and racism in the same right. earlier. It, you know, it, it was really the Cleveland Indians, right, who came first in 1946. And why did they came? Well, you know, obviously Bill Veck had a ranch out in Tucson that he wanted to be close to and, you know, make baseball big in the springtime here. But as much as that was they signed Larry Doby and you couldn't train in the South with the first African-American baseball player in the, in the American league. Mm -hmm. So the giants followed and you know, obviously they had the most diverse clubhouse um, going eventually, you know, in, in, in the late fifties, early sixties. But uh, um, this was, you know, and, and again, it was hard. There, there was a lot of racism here. It was hard. They couldn't stay at hotels. They couldn't eat at restaurants and, but it wasn't as bad as the Deep South. So uh, Horace Stoneham, even, you know, Casa Grande, Horace Stoneham brought his team to Casa Grande, built up this resort and golf club and made the pool look like a bat and made the parking look, lot look like a glove and the, and, and the hotel look like a stadium. It was just wild, extravagant stuff. And, it, you know, it didn't last long and it didn't become, you know, the next Scottsdale. But, uh, you know, that's how much they kind of went out of the way to just create these environments for the ballplayers because it was all encompassing um, one stop shopping. You know, they had hotels, they had golf, they had baseball, they had workouts, they had nightlife, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's no more baseball in Casa Grande, at least in spring training. But it's nice all these teams are in the valley because I remember we used to go to Yuma and, and Tucson and and uh, all kinds of different places. It's all white right now within an hour of each other. Yeah, you wonder why. I mean, baseball, obviously, it's a business. And, and even in the book, you have uh, one of the owners as part of the character in the book um, who doesn't seem to be doing things for the, for the benefit of the team, <laughs> more, personal. Yeah. more personal. And um, you wonder, you know, obviously, there's money involved. Um, but their, mo their money isn't necessarily the team for a lot of them. It's, it's just a sideline. Um, mm -hmm. So he can do whatever he wishes for it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be positive for the team, as long as it's for him. Um, but in real life, um, even though it is a sideline, there are some owners who get very involved and some owners who, who don't. Um, but when you write it, you when you wrote it about it in, in the book, he, he to me anyway, he seemed that his his own well being and his needs superseded all else. Not not necessarily the product on the field. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we get emotional, right? <laughs> I I think, you know, um, I I don't know, I'm still smarting from uh, I'm a Mariners fan and still smarting from uh, everything with it's Kevin Mather, right? The, the um, president that just imploded. Oh. You know, um, sometimes people, yeah, are, are not, you know, even if, you know, scouts honor, they have the team's best interests in mind. I don't think, um, you know, every human operates um, at their, at their best all the time and and his emotions got the best of him and um yeah i just i thought that was an important dimension to show is sometimes people do take things personally 
and yeah, I mean, you know, traded away a, a relatively good player. And, right. Um, and they're, I mean, they're veteran. Uh, he wasn't yeah. as good as Jason Goodyear, but he, he was a great outfielder and, you know, a, a personal tiff um, yeah. uh, got in the way of that. Yeah. But that, that also speaks to, I think, you know, the, I made up this team, the Los Angeles Lions and, you know, for better or worse, their, their acquisition strategy, their, their strategies, you know, sort of an overinvestment in one athlete and, um, really building the team around that player and, and making everyone else fairly expendable. Um, I don't, I mean, just by, as I talk about it, you can probably tell it's not how I would build the baseball team, but I, you know, you see that strategy, um, on my stepdad's a Steelers fan and, uh, you know, just like really building a whole franchise around, um, you know, one quarterback or, or one, you know, MVP, um, Sometimes people do that. And uh, what does that mean for the other 25 guys? <laughs> right. Well, you know, they, there is their first woman general manager now, I believe, with the Dodgers. Is that right? So do you think oh. with all your experience, you might slip into a position like that? Oh, I don't think so. Um, it's with Kim, right? With, um, yes. with the Marlins? Kim, Kim Ng from the Marlins, yeah. yeah. Marlins, okay. No, I think that's so exciting. Um, no, I, I don't think I'll go into front office work, but I, I will I will happily, you know, uh, quarterback from the couch and, and complain about decisions I don't agree with. <laughs> yeah, it, it's long overdue. And, and you you had mentioned the Giants, uh, Emily, with Alyssa Nacken, the right. first female coach in the big leagues. And every day out here, she spends half the day coaching first base. And it's last so year- exciting oh, to see her on the- on the field it's so it's, a, it's amazing and it's heartwarming and it, it, it's it, it I, talking to brandon crawford their shortstop he said this shouldn't be a story i said what do you mean he said it should be normal it's great you're doing the story but and and he's right he, he told me this last spring train and then we went through the whole year he you know she was in the dugout okay and this year it's it's normal so it's not a story and <laughs> over coaching first base and there aren't five photographers um, you know, shadowing her, which is great because, you know, a young girl is going to watch her on TV and said, okay, I could do that. And, and you know, they'll see Kim Ng, um, you know, in, in a suite above the stadium in, in Miami. And they'll say, oh, that's great. I, I can do that. Right. Because I came into the game where there was none of that. My roommate back in the eighties, uh, Donna Balancia, she was like the part-time Padre beat writer. She and I worked together. And it's just awful stuff that you heard when she entered the clubhouse. I mean, now, um, you know, sometimes it's 50, 50 and it's, it's normal because these players grew up. That's the only clubhouse they know with right. men and women covering the game. So there's, there's nothing abnormal about it. And that's, that's, it's wonderful how times have changed for the better, but man, we've got a long way to go. Right. Well, I've heard interviews with, with cap just saying, you know, I'm a feminist and I, you know, that's, remarkable just to have um not that he's I mean I'm glad he's saying it and it shouldn't be news but just I think you know even in the last decade sort of how the conversation about women not having these like physiologically um wild arms that they can suddenly throw 100 mile per hour fastballs but just you know the um their talent innate and and hard work and um what they can bring to the team even if it's not you know physical um, expertise, but just uh, professional expertise is really, it's exciting that that door is finally opening. Well, even, well, a lot of teams now employ or even the players employ uh, coaches, uh, emotional coaches or personal coaches to help them with the, I assume that the stress and the everyday uh, anxiety that goes into playing playing the game mm. mental skills coaches larry mental really? skills no, okay. I, I i did not get any of those into the cactus league <laughs> oh, that's really, i'm just mm -hmm. trying to think if i missed any any characters besides the old coach who s starts off the book when his house is somebody is squatting in his house yeah i'm trying to think if i left anyone out of that but i think I've covered there's that. an organist there's oh, a, right, the organist. Uh, there, there's a concessions 
uh, worker. Yeah, I really, you know, I, I just, the experience of going into a stadium, I wanted to think about who, who do you see as a, as a fan? Who do you not see um, as a fan, as a player? Um, really thinking about, um, you know, the, the stadium as an organism and all the different parts of, of, that, um, of that world. Right. Well, it bookends with hope and, um, and, and positive note that, that um, things will, will, will get better, which, uh, and is the second book now you're writing um, in any way also baseball related or? Um, no, I mean, I could write about baseball forever. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to write the the Mariners chapter in the baseball prospectus, and that was a lot of fun and more more sports writing uh, than you know my my fictional uh, explorations. And so I, I'd love to write about baseball again, but I'm I'm trying to use a little bit of a different muscle this time around. There's still some sports, um, right. but it's a different sport. Uh, so that's that's it's still early going though. Yeah. Uh, so I'll hopefully. Hopefully I'll feel good about talking about it by next spring. <laughs> well, th this was a tough year for baseball. I wrote it down on where, but some of the players uh, that passed this year. Um, yeah. And Gibson and Aaron and, and Seaver and, and Nitro. And, I mean, it was, it, I don't know, maybe, maybe because I'm older, I it, it impacted more, but um, you could have made an all century team out of those people who, this last uh, this last season and um, some of the all-time greats Whitey Ford so anyway um, and how, how is Willie doing now is he so Whitey Ford was the oldest baseball player in the Hall of Fame Tommy Lasorda was the oldest Hall of Famer and now they're both gone and right uh, now we have Willie, who's the oldest. He'll be 90 in May, just a couple of months away. He's doing great. He, uh, in fact, he wanted to be here, and he's sorry he can't be here. He was here a year ago at this time and was in the clubhouse every single day before Giants home games in the, at Scottsdale Stadium. So I actually called him on the way. I, I rented a car and drove down here 11 hours from the Bay Area. And I called him on the way. I just wanted to make sure I touched bases with him to, to, to kind of reaffirm that there's really nothing to do down here for him or if Barry Bonds wanted to visit or, or Cepeda or Gaylord Perry, none of these guys, because they couldn't get in the clubhouse and they couldn't get on the field. It's not like the old days where, you know, the pre-pandemic where you just had the run of the place, if you're Willie Mays. And it's unfortunate because he takes, proudly takes the the, uh, the role to heart that he works for the team. He just doesn't want a paycheck. He wants to be there for the players and the manager and fans and the media. <laughs> and, and that's how I got to know him well, because he was always in the clubhouse and kids would come up and they'd be intimidated. They wouldn't speak to him for weeks or months. Brandon Crawford, Brandon Belt, Posey, all these guys tell me, but then you learn, Hey, he's not going to come up to me. I got to go up to him. Mm. If I want any advice, you know, I, I, he's not going to knock on my door. I got to go knock on his door. And then once you do, you're, you're in, you're golden, but he can't come here now. And hopefully, you know, by, by late summer, he could start going out to the games and, and maybe, by September, the following spring, in, in back in the clubhouse where, you know, he thinks he belongs. He's a baseball guy. He used to say, hey, kid. And that really never changed. Uh, baseball is just so part, so such a big part of his life. And, uh, and you know, he's, he's waiting for the day that uh, we, we have normalcy. Well, if he comes back here, he definitely has to come. And we, we'll, we'll save up a supply of your books. Yeah. <laughs> we can get them both signed. You know what I love about this conversation is, is, you know, Emily is fiction. I'm writing nonfiction, but, but the characters, it's like the same thing. I'm hearing her speak. And by the way, I'm, I was nervous starting here because I said, Oh my God, I'm in here with Emily. And, 
uh, and, and it's like we, we both write about this outfielder who's the best in the game mm-hmm. and you know the epitome of American culture right the the baseball player everyone gravitates everyone overlaps his life his career and uh well well uh you know Jason Goodyear might have a nine-digit contract Willie Mays topped out at $165,000 and that's why Horace Stoneham the owner you were referencing traded him to the Mets because he was making too much money <laughs> Yeah, those are nineteen seventy dollars, though. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I don't have any other uh, questions, so I don't know if uh, Patrick, are you still here? I am indeed. Okay. You want to show some of these great pictures? Sure. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, this is me and Willie uh, talking about the book, uh, interviewing him. Uh, Brad Manson, the great photographer in the Bay Area, really helped me, as did uh, Kurt Aguilar on the editing side, put this together. I mean, just two co-MVPs in in my land. But uh, he took that shot uh, that I was talking with him, and it was a great moment for Willie, because he loves talking baseball, and so do I. And and like I said, I just put it on a tee for him and he's so descriptive. And you know what? It hit me during this, that he never, ever, ever used a cliche. And I hear it all the time in clubhouses and on Zoom now from players. And you hear the same cliches over and over because it's like a stalling device or it's something to say if you don't have something to say. And Willie never, ever gave me a cliche. I don't think he knows what one is. And it's all true, you know, through the heart and, and real and it's like all his inner circle friends read the book and said, you captured his voice because every word in there is what I've heard him say. And that was like the ultimate compliment. Oh, that's Air Force One. And Willie and um... a, a less a less gray Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, they were heading to the all star game in St. Louis. Uh, and, and Brad Manjin is a friend of every photographer in the world, uh, including Obama's uh, personal photographer. So we had access to some unbelievable art. There's almost a hundred pictures in this book. Wow. So there's no other Willie book with that many, it's not a picture book, but there's like a hundred pictures in this book. And every one uh, uh, of Willie, you know, going back to childhood and playing in the Negro Leagues and on and on. Hey, can I ask Emily a question while you go through these? Sure. Yeah. No, I just wanted to know about that transition from, I mean, you, you, you've you done it all. I mean, your resume lasted a, two minutes while Larry went through it. And, uh-huh. and, 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 you know, everything you do, and now the first novel that you've written and you have another one coming. But what was that transition like, you know? Paris Review, all, all the all all the background you have in art and architecture and editing and working with different writers and, and now suddenly you're the one uh, and you've written a ton already but maybe nothing like this. Yeah, I mean it is a big change. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I was working sixty to eighty hours a week, um, just every, you know, you think, I I have so much respect for for a daily paper, but, um, you know, the quarterly was, was a pretty, we're real small staff, and it was a lot of work, and, and even before that, at the Southern Review, which is, you know, another storied literary quarterly, um, founded by Robert Penn Warren in the 30s, uh, we were a staff of two, (laughs) and so I was always, you know, uh, I love editing other writers, and, and being a steward for their work, but, um, you know, the whole time I've been a writer, I've also been an editor. And, and to be frank, I've always put that work ahead of my own um, because, because I, I take the responsibility really seriously. And so um, I just really wanted to see what it would feel like to, um, to put my work first and, and see, you know, can I write another book I'm really proud of? Can I write it more quickly? Because the Cactus League took nine years. Um, you know, I would file 
um, I would ship that quarterly and then, you know, sort of go into a cave for a week if I was lucky and, and come out with a new chapter draft or an overhaul. Um, you know, I, I haven't taken a weekday off or a weekend off, you know, in probably four or five years, just in terms of my weekends are my writing time now. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a big step and I'm, you know, I, I still love the Paris Review and I wish them all the best, but I, I really wanted to see what would happen if I um, gave myself a little more space. Wow. You did a great job with the book. I mean, anybody interested in, first of all, just good writing, but I'm from, from both books, but baseball, if you like it at all, I mean, have any interest. These are really two great books about baseball. Uh, and like you said, you both, you both wrote about incredible outfielders. Right. Although Jason does have an tr unassisted triple play to his credit. <laughs> Willie didn't do that. <laughs> so. Yeah, but well, I don't think Jason had 660 home runs. I mean, he's got a good bat, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I, he, he's, not, he's not the power hitter that right. Willie Mays was. No. Well, I don't think Willie Mays ever considered himself, you know, like in today's world, a power hitter. Because uh, he always hit for average, too. It, it, he was, um, yeah, well, he's just one of a kind, really. Just, yeah, 5'10", yeah, 180 yeah. was always what it said on the back of a baseball card when, when right. you're 20, the 5'10", 180. I want to be 5'10", 180. <laughs> and I started interviewing him and writing stories. And he said, hey, John, one time he said, John, that was a good story today, but you made a mistake. And I said, what was that, Willie? He said, I'm not 5'10", I'm 5'11". <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So all those baseball cards were wrong. And, uh, and so for forever more, I, including in the book, he's 5'11". So if he said, if the man says he's 5'11", five, but it's, it's cute because these days, if you're 5'11", they make you six feet or 6'1". You know, they, they add an inch or two to make you a little bit. Well, the cleats, the well, cleats make them tall. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he just wanted to be 5'11". He wanted to set the record straight, but you're right. He, he wasn't a power hitter, but, you know, he almost broke the home run record of all time. And, uh, and maybe he wasn't the greatest hitter or the greatest base runner or the greatest outfielder, but he sure did everything great. And was, and like he said, I want, my dad always told me be top five and everything. And indeed he was. Yeah. It, to me, Willie May will always be joy. It just, you could see it when he played, you could see it when he, talk to him I could see it off the field he always just epitomized joy doing what he was doing and you know um Emily you mentioned the 200 interviews you know in my day job if I put out 10 phone calls I hope to get five back you know mm -hmm. three four but when I say it's for a Willie Mays book I'm batting a thousand and that included President Clinton and President Bush and Hank Aaron and uh Everybody has a Willie Mays story, and um, it, it's just fascinating, you know, Monty Irvin, and, you know, when I first got into this, you know, it might have been back in 05, 06, when he kind of agreed and I started doing the research. I wanted to talk to people like Alvin Dark, who was his teammate in New York and his manager in the 60s in San Francisco, and there were a lot of issues with Alvin over race because uh, the Latin American players didn't didn't really uh, dig him because he told them not to speak Spanish in the clubhouse. You imagine that the three LO brothers not speaking Spanish in the clubhouse. And he told Orlando Cepeda and Marichal and um, some African-Americans, some, some things that he just, uh, anyway, I, I, I got his complete story and I brought it to Willie and, and Orlando and Felipe and these guys. And, and the beauty of this storytelling in, in a forum like this is not to just, like in the newspaper, you just you pick and choose little pieces, little sound bites, but it's to tell the complete story. Now, Alvin Dark, while considered a racist as a manager, years later, regretted what he did, regretted what he said. And at an old timers game between Giants and Dodgers, um, all the players from 62, many years later, they got together in Arizona here and at the hotel, Alvin Dark went around to each Latin American player, each African American player he insulted and apologized. Mm -hmm. And Orlando Cepeda said that it was, it was a wonderful thing. We all cried and he 
basically said Alvin Dark did not want to bring that to his grave. He didn't want that in his heart when he died. Mm. And I, I said all the sub stories of, of Willie Mays and, and oftentimes Willie is the is the peacekeeper, the uniter. He's the one who brought um, Johnny Roseboro off the field when Marischal clubbed him with the bat at Candlestick Park. Uh, you know, he's the one who brought peace to the 73 uh, series when the Mets and Reds were playing, when when they were throwing whiskey bottles at Pete Rose in left field. Mays went out there and told the fans to cool it, and they did. I mean, so often uh, th there are stories mostly behind the scenes. He wasn't like Hank or especially Jackie, you know, who marched with Martin Luther King Jr. and 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 said things that were, you know, wonderful and and informative and important and 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 we live by what they say. But Willie didn't do that. He did everything behind the scenes because that's what his dad told him to do. He said, "Don't make too much of a scene." you know, work with guys behind the scenes, but don't be out front. And Willie lived by that. And, you know, to his credit, you know, he stood by it forever. And, um, you know, I guess that's to be honored because you, I, I spoke to so many next generation players like Joe Morgan and Willie McCovey and Reggie Jackson and Maury Wills and, and even Hank Aaron, who's three years younger. And they all gave me anecdotes and stories about how Willie influenced them and including during the the civil rights movement and to do things the right way. And uh, as a, as an elder African-American ball player, they really looked up to him and kind of idolized him. And a lot of people didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He's tr truly a, one of a, one of baseball and America's great, greatest. He really did. Um, Patrick, are there any other questions at all? Uh, no, no real questions. Okay. I think they're, I think they're just, ra this has been a wonderful conversation. I think they've all just been kicking back and enjoying it. Okay. Well, um, the books are available um, here at Poison Pen. Um, and if you would, uh, like to get one, just uh, get on online or give us a call. Uh, I really appreciated the time. Both, just fantastic, really. Both, both of you were just great, and the, the books speak for themselves. They really are just just wonderful. Actually, I have a question for both of you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your next projects? <laughs> I'll start um. with Emily. Yeah, I'm working on another novel. Uh, I'm, it's a little early to talk too much about it, but you know, it's it's a little bit, like I said, I, I could write about baseball forever, um, but I'm writing more about art and contemporary art and using that part of my brain and that part of my background in this next book. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing some more illustration. I'm, I'm back to um, submitting cartoons to the New Yorker so hopefully I'll, I'll get get another cartoon in there soon. Cool. You, you know, it just it just hit me, uh, Emily. Sorry for uh, continuing this. Where you, you might want to shut it down, but I, I think you, you're you were a fan of uh, the book, uh, you know, Pathco at the Wall, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, and and I'm a, I'm a fan of the book uh, A Day in the Bleachers. Mm. Uh, Arnold Hanno, who was there in his 30s, I think, and sitting in the bleachers and writing about the same thing, right? The same day, the same game. Yeah. You know, it's where it's where uh, I don't know fiction and nonfiction overlap. But but uh, I, I just I don't know why I mentioned it. I just thought of it. It's it's pretty cool that. Uh, it is. that well, it's, mm -hmm. I I learned so much from from long form nonfiction and and journalism that really is you know, world building, whether it's Roger Angel or, or John McPhee. And, you know, he sometimes heard about sports more often not, but um, I just, I think the intersection and the overlaps of, you know, certainly I'm, I'm writing from life experience and lived experience, but the possibilities of research and the generosity of telling someone else's story, which is, you know, what you did with 24 and, and what journalists do every day is, is so exciting and, and just something um, that, I love to do. So 
the next book, I, like I said, I'm speaking a bit vaguely about it, but it will certainly continue to think about the world and through research and, and you know, the possibility of observing and, and analyzing and imagining, you know, where we go next and how we respond to um, some of life's challenges. And there might be some surfing as well. I'll give you that. <laughs> John, what well, are you working on now? I mean, this season, do you have, do you have predictions, predictions? On, on the season? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm covering the, uh, the Giants and the A's down here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the, if the Giants get to 500, that would, that would, you know, I, I think they haven't done that in four years. So that would be a step up. The A's are going all out to win a division, but it's so hard to bet against the Dodgers. They're so well-rounded. There hasn't been a team to repeat World Series titles since the Yankees at the turn of the century. And in the National League, what's the last team? Maybe the Big Red Machine in the 70s? It's just not done. But right. and, and yeah, it was a shortened season, but it's legit. They got, they're going to get rings and they're going to get a trophy. But uh, I, I don't see teams beyond the Dodgers and, and I know how much the Padres upgraded and, and threw all kinds of money at that rotation and you know, Tatis Jr. is just a wonderful ball player and Machado over at third but they still haven't done it and until you you know you know you got to beat the best to be the best and all that and right now the Dodgers are the best so the Padres have a lot to prove and I would love to see a National League championship series with those two teams we've seen plenty of the Yankees and Red Sox over the years by the way we've never seen Giants Dodgers in an NLCS it never happened um, for whatever reason it's always one team is good the other team is down vice versa but I'd love to see Padres uh, try to take down the Dodgers in the NLCS this year well there was the 62 playoffs Dodgers uh, no no, that's wrong. They weren't playoffs. They were regular season games. 51 as well. 51 and 62, the Giants. Oh, no, I, no, no. Yeah, I know that. But they were they were similar to a – they were a three-game playoff. It was the best of three. Yeah. And uh, it was games, you know, 163, four, and five. Right. And um, – but, yeah, and then, and then back in New York, they did the same in, in 51 when – you know, Thompson hit his home run with uh, <laughs> Fafco at the wall and Arnold Hanno in the bleachers. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank you for again. It was just a marvelous time talking to you both. And uh, I just want to show the books again for people. To, to get. This is The Cactus League by Emily Niemans and 24 by... John Shea and Willie Mays, great Willie Mays. So again, thank you both. We really appreciate yeah. it. And good luck with the future endeavors. And when the world gets straight again, <laughs> hopefully you could get out here and, and um, we could do a proper book signing. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Emily, sir. Great Bye -bye. to meet you. Thanks so much. All right, we're off Facebook now. So um, thanks, everybody. That was great. Thank you, Brad. Uh, yeah, and we'll be putting it putting it up. It'll live on on our Facebook page and also on YouTube. I'll go ahead and put it up there. And um, and also we convert the audio only portion into a podcast, and those have done really well for us. So great. getting it from all different angles. So, so surfing, we, surfing we, Emily. Now you're talking. Uh, Okay, thank you. All right. Take care. Yeah, Emily, I was just going to ask about the surfing part. Oh yeah. That sounds that sounds really cool. Yeah, I'm. I I mean, William Finnegan's book. Oh yeah. Barbarian just, Days. The perfect book. Um, I probably have to read it like seven more times because I don't surf. Um, but um, I just yeah. I I mean, it's not as good as baseball for literature, but I think surfing and writing. Um, is, is pretty interesting and um, there's a lot of dramatic potential in a big wave, right? 
There's some good, uh, you know, some good surfing novels I could recommend to you. Um, oh, if you're not, uh, if you're not aware, um, one of them is, it's called Tapping the Source. Mm -hmm. It's by an author named Kim Nunn. And it's kind of the quintessential hard-boiled detective novel meets surfing in the late 70s in California. Mm -hmm. Really good book. Um, there's another one called uh, The Dawn Patrol. Yeah, I've heard of that one. Don Winslow. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, there are a couple of other good ones too. Dogs of Winter, also by Kem Nunn. Those are really interesting. But that, yeah. that whole subculture and almost, you know, spiritual, the way, you know, those surfers live their lives, it's kind of attractive and appealing, isn't it? It is. And um, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm writing about the contemporary art world in New York, which is a little bit the opposite of that. But um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I'm maybe manufacturing, but maybe not. Um, well, that's exciting. My 18 year old daughter uh, surfs a lot. Oh, so she does? I, I, I know what to buy her once it comes out. Yeah. It'll be a little while yet. Um, yeah, I mean, there's good, there's good waves near you, right? And, and not the big ones, but, but good consistent surfing. Yeah. Out there. Yeah, she learned on her own and she goes out there regularly. And uh, yeah, it's, she just really digs it. You know, I, I went to San Diego State and had a surfing class in college and uh -huh. I, got two, I got two units for it, but it did me no good. She's really good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, I'll go ahead and wrap it up here, but uh, thanks again, everybody.